My name is Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings. I work on issues of inequality and social mobility, which is a fancy way of saying I sit in my office and wait for Raj and his team to produce their new paper <laughs> and try and write it up and question my own occupational choices. Um, I'd like to say that by the age of 30, I think 30 or early 30s is the, uh, the point that's used to measure patenting. The number of patents I'd taken out was zero, so I'm a zero patent person by the age of 30. Who else is a zero patent person by the age of 30? Okay, so that tells us absolutely nothing because um, <laughs> that's an N of whatever, uh, and Raj likes to deal with Ns of 200 million or something, which is why his sample's better than the one I just used. Um, I will say, though, just to add something not specifically on Raj's scholarship, but the way his team operates and has had access to high-quality administrative data underlines the importance of being able to access and match uh, and use administrative data. And I think that, that is something that is particularly on the minds of many of us at Brookings right now, which is to be able to access that data and use it. And secondly, Raj and his team have done an exemplary job of making, and you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner, data available at the project, um, which means that those of us who are trying to catching up with some of the work that Raj and his team are doing, the data is all available online. And it's available online in a very usable format. You can download it in Stata or Excel, um, and therefore ask lots of kind of different questions. I just want to commend Raj and his team for um, for the work that they've been doing on that. So I'm going to briefly introduce our two panellists who are going to briefly respond to Raj. I might add some of my own thoughts. We're going to have a moderated discussion up here on the stage, and then I'll invite your questions. So first of all, we're going to hear from Reshma, who is uh, on your right. Reshma Sajani is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code. Raj has already mentioned that her work, which is a national non-profit working to close the gender gap in technology, so highly relevant to the work that Raj has been doing. In 2010, Reshma became the first Indian-American woman to run for Congress. And she's the author of uh, many articles and books, including Girls Who Code, Learn to Code, and Change the World. Uh, and then we're going to hear from, on your left, um, Professor Tony Jack, who is a junior fellow at Harvard Society of Fellows and an assistant professor of education at Harvard. Um, he has uh, been named by the University of Michigan in 2016 as an emerging diversity scholar, and his own book, which is forthcoming from Harvard University Press, is called The Privileged Poor, which looks at those from, uh, just a, from low income backgrounds but with a privileged education who end up at elite universities. They're each going to speak for five minutes, then I'm going to moderate a discussion. So, Reshma, you first. Sure. Over to you. Um, hello. Uh, Reshma, CEO and founder of, of Girls Who Code. Um, I spend my life trying to teach girls how to computer program. Uh, full disclosure, I am not a coder. Uh, I was definitely not in the top of my class, my math class, at, in third grade, so I wouldn't have been you know, identified as, a, as an inventor. Well, but, um, you know, my parents came here as refugees, and they were expelled from Uganda. I've had a job since I was 12 years old, and so I'm a big believer in the American dream. And from a very young age, I wanted to give back. Uh, ironically, I thought the way to do that would be through politics. Um, ran for office. Lost miserably. Um, but as part of that experience, I would end up going into a lot of New York City schools. And I'd walk into their computer science classes or their robotics classes, and I would just see a ton of boys, right, clamoring to be the next Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, where are the girls, right? At a time where women are the majority in college, the majority in the labor force. 40% of all of America's breadwinners, where are we in this industry that is literally shaping our collective future? And so I started an organization to try to solve that problem. And over the past seven years, we've taught over 50,000 girls how to computer program. Uh, put that into perspective, only 10,000 women graduated in computer science. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about the future of work, right? How do you increase opportunity to the American dream? Well, it's in a computing job. You know, 71% of all STEM jobs are in computing where you can make $120,000 a year as a software programmer right when you get out of college. And the problem is, is that you talk to any business executive and they can't find enough engineers and I think the solution to that is women. But if you look over the past 40 years in our country, you know, women have been dropping out of technology. 80% of all, uh, I mean, if you, in the 1980s, about 50% of all computer scientists were women. This panel in the 1980s would have been called Where are the Missing Marie Curies, not Where are the Lost Einsteins. Today, that number is less than 
You know, and a lot of that has to do with, well, I think, two important things. One is culture. You know, I, we talked about this earlier. You cannot be what you cannot see. That's why Raj's work is so important, because I think it identifies something that we've seen in our work. Girls are inspired by what their parent does, what their next-door neighbor does, who they see on television. And when every day they look at the face of an inventor or an entrepreneur and they see Mark Zuckerberg and they don't see themselves, that doesn't inspire them to think that this is something that they can actually do. Culture has played a huge role in pushing girls out. We still have Barbie dolls that say, I hate math, let's go shopping instead. You can walk into a Forever 21 and buy a t-shirt that says I'm allergic to algebra. Mean Girls, which we watch on repeat, all of us here do, right? <laughs> Remember that scene where she gets an A on her math test and she crosses it out and puts a D just to get the affections of a boy? Culture is having a massive effect on making this STEM gap get even larger. And I think the second thing is, and again, Raj talks a lot about this too, is this idea of risk aversion. How do we inspire failure? To be an inventor, you have to be really excited about failing. And here's the thing. You know, our girls are not excited about failing because from a very young age, we straighten their dress and we fix their clothes. And when their bow falls off, we make sure that it is on perfectly. You meet my son, he's three years old, he's a pig pen. He's got a booger in his nose and yesterday's breakfast, he is a mess. You know we're lying. He is free to be who he wants to be, right? And so this idea of how do we stop coddling our girls? How do we inspire imperfection? How do we teach bravery, right? How do we teach them that you, are, you don't have a fixed mindset, that you can learn everything and anything, that rejection is awesome? Once we teach that, I think we will inspire a generation of women who will fail and who will build inventions. The, the last thing I want, and I want to close because I know Richard's going to tell me to stop talking, is this issue is so important um, because there are so many innovations that are sitting on the sidelines because we are not solving this problem. I am surrounded by teenage girls. And in our programs, you can build whatever you want. And every single time I, I see this, I see Cora, whose father has MS. And so she decided that she wanted to be a doctor because she wanted to save her father's life. Well, when she could build whatever she wanted, she built an algorithm to help detect whether a cancer is benign or malignant. I have 16-year-old girls in Austin who were so sick and tired that Congress couldn't get it together to pass a bill on funding that they built a machine learning tool to track where Zika is going. Girls are constantly seeing problems in their community, whether it's climate change, whether it's homelessness, whether it's inequity, and they are using technology to solve them. Just go to our project gallery on girlswhocode.com and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. So if you want to change the world, you want to solve these problems, you not only have to teach girls to code, but you have to do the very recommendations that Raj talks about in his report, and we can close the gender gap in this issue, and at the same time, save our world and our country while doing it. Mm. Good. Thank you for setting the bar so high for us. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but good, can't you follow that? Just, uh, just myself left, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I uh, love this research because we do know that mentors matter. Um, I study students who, especially low income students at the college level, and we know that contact with professors, deans, um, presidents, residential counselors, is the mechanism through which they get access to institutional resources, right? Whether it's counseling, whether it's support on a grant, an application, summer internship, um, whether it's just understanding how to set up their first bank account. But not everybody feels comfortable reaching out to an adult, especially an adult that they, have, that they only met in the first uh, week of school. Especially how social class shapes these particular processes, right? And so I always, in my research, I ask the question, what does it mean to be a poor student on a rich campus? Mm. We have an understanding that to be a poor student on a rich campus is about isolation, it's about culture shock, it's about not understanding what to do. Mm. And we base policies and we try outreach based upon that, that understanding, but that understanding is only half right. Because the reason why my work um, in the book uh, is called The Privileged Poor is because I study and I show that roughly half of the lower income African Americans at elite colleges on average graduate from Andover, Exeter, Deerfield, and St. Paul's. 
which cuts against the grain. What is a student who lives in Section 8 housing and receives food stamps doing going to a, a high school that costs almost $60,000 a year? Mm. And colleges get their new diversity from old sources. They go to these well-trodden wells to get their diversity. And what, that ha what happens is you have half the students who graduate from disadvantaged high schools, and they come in with one set of strategies for engaging adults. And it typically is withdrawal. It's about deference, because we don't teach being um, agentic about reaching out to adults in, in our public schools. But if you go to a private high school where the average class size is 11, and most classes are smaller than that, and you're used to sitting around the Harkness table talking to a professor about the differences between your favorite classical musicians, you begin to have an understanding of how to interact with adults. You become comfortable with it. And so when you get to college and you hear those two words that everyone says but no one actually defines, office hours, hmm. you become very comfortable. You know where to go to ask for help for an extension, not because you need it, but because you want to watch The Crown, as I felt to do, <laughs> right? But it's very interesting that I talked to a dean at Dean College, and she said that when she told her working class students that my office hours are from Tuesday from 3 to 4, students from working class background took that as a time that she should not be bothered. Mm. So she was left in her office twirling her thumbs, waiting for students to come to her so that she could mentor, which is the exact opposite of what office hours are. But if we don't do that kind of translational work, our students, especially our lower income students, and our students who are, who are women will continually be trapped by this hidden curriculum mm -hmm. of a whole bunch of things that are always expected of us to know, that are so gendered, so classed, and so raised that we will always have the gap between access. That means getting into these universities, getting into these jobs, and being fully included in them, getting access to all the resources. And so until we close that gap, between access and inclusion, we will always have some of the inequality that you see because it's being reproduced in these institutions. Mm -hmm. are, we admitting the, are we admitting students? Are we admitting employees? Are we admitting fellows? But we're not actually prepared for them. Mm -hmm. Are we prepared for students from rural Appalachia and the, and, the, and, um, and the inner city as well as those from the suburbs? Are our counseling centers able to handle all of their issues to help them succeed, but also all of their interests? Because it's not always a burden to introduce more lower income minority and women into organization. It's a privilege and a benefit. Mm -hmm. And until we change that orientation, we will always be behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, the act about mentor is absolutely important. We need more students who have access to mentors. But those mentors also have to be ready to, to be able to understand who is sitting in front of them. Do you only know how to mentor white men who are heterosexual, come from upper middle class backgrounds and went to private school? And that's the fundamental question that I know as a professor, a lot of us have to ask because they come in with a certain set of expectations, strategies for engagement, and understanding of self that aligns with, oh, that person's being, you know, you know, putting itself out there. We should reward that. We shouldn't reward class strategy. We should reward talent and ability. And the question is, are we ready to do that? <coughs> Thank you, Tony. Right. Thank you, Rashma and Tony, for those, those comments. I'd like to pull out a couple um, of things to put back to you, Raj, but then invite the two of you too before I add a couple. Let's start with risk aversion and the kinds of relationships that seem to foster these kinds of opportunities. I think okay, Rashma's point, you look at your charts and say, well, one reason kids from higher income backgrounds might be more willing to think about taking out a patent or even take some risks is because the downside risk is much lower for them. Bob mm -hmm. Putnam has a great phrase, which is like everyone crashes, but rich kids have airbags, mm. right? And so it doesn't work <laughs> out. And so there's a whole sense of kind of like risk, but I think really comes out of Rushmore's comments quite strongly. And then the second point, uh, I think, relates to, to both comments, but Tony is about mentoring and the kinds of relationships and the exposure effect you find. So it's like, what kind of relationships? Mentoring covers a very broad spectrum. Arguably, parents are mentoring their kids, and that's a very thick relationship. That's a very, very intimate kind of mentoring. Or it could be someone who you see twice a couple of times and then feel good about yourself at dinner parties because you're mentoring, right? Um, which is very thin and doesn't seem to have much effect. I'm looking at your maps and your charts across commuting zones and just inviting you to think about how far do you think those ties are stretching? Do you think that within the D.C. commuting zone, a kid who's growing up in northeast D.C. is more likely to take out a patent because there's a bunch of people doing that in northern Virginia? You know, I don't know. How, how far do those ties stretch? What kind of relationships matter? So risk and relationships. Right? 
Thanks, uh, Richard, and thanks for the great comments. So uh, on the issue of risk, so I absolutely agree with the intuition that that risk aversion can matter quite a bit. I think it might matter here in a very particular way. So I didn't spend time on a set of results where we look at how this data breaks down by college. So you can find online, as Richard pointed out on, on our website, um, data on innovation rates by college and parental income. And the interesting pattern that you see there, if you look at the colleges that produce the most kids who go on to become inventors, these are places like MIT and so on, the kinds of places you think of, but also other institutions like Kettering uh, University, which is a place outside Detroit, I think in Flint, where you see lots of kids go on to have patents there. The pattern you see in all of those colleges is that the gradient that I was showing you, the large gap in innovation between kids from low and high income families, is much, much attenuated. There's a much smaller gap between kids from low and high income families uh, among those attending MIT. And so why do I bring that up in the context of risk? If you thought that it was really about risk preferences, you might expect that the kids at Stanford from low income families go on to become doctors or pursue other professions while the kids from higher income families take the risks of becoming entrepreneurs or inventors. In fact, you don't see that much of a difference. So that makes me think, at least in the, in the labor market, this is not really about differences in uh, risk preferences. It's about factors that are affecting you before you get to college. Now, that said, it could be that kids from higher income families are more willing to take chances or pursue certain things while they're in school before they get to college mm. than, than uh, kids in lower income families, right? And so I think those kinds of ideas could make a lot of sense. But to me, a lot of this ties back to differences in childhood environment and childhood opportunities, which could then influence risk preferences as opposed to the way we usually think about risk is, you know, you're working in the labor market, you face risk and I don't. I think that narrow conception of it doesn't quite fit the data. On the second issue of exposure, so um, I think uh, from, from working with these data in various contexts, in this particular instance of becoming an inventor, it's the strong, deep connections that really matter. So if you think about the technology class specificity, for instance, mm. that's more consistent with the idea that somebody is influencing you in a very particular way to pursue a particular pathway, as opposed to generally, you know, as you put it, in Northern Virginia, there are a bunch of people doing this thing and you kind of heard about it, you know. How would you have heard about this one very specific thing? A more direct answer in our ongoing work, one of the things we're working on is zooming in from this very broad geography that we've been working with of metro areas or counties, which of course are, nobody thinks of their neighborhood as the entire DC metro area. But that's really has been a data limitation in the past in terms of having to work at that level. We're now zooming in to be able to look at the data at the tract level. So tracts consist of about 4,000 people. So really fine definitions of neighborhoods. And one of the findings uh, that's emerging from that work is that what really matters is neighborhoods in a very, very precise sense, mm -hmm. not even three miles away, really within a mile, yeah. or you know, in a very particular way. Or it's about social networks you know, that might stratify those boundaries. But I think it's much more precise than the general. So presumably, your, your maps are conditional on the parents having. So when you say the exposure <coughs> effect, so we know it's not just the direct effect of the parents. But, but it we're could excluding be the, kids whose parents yeah, are in so it could be, but, friend, but it's friends of parents. It's your exactly. immediate neighbor. It's, exactly. it's not the person on the other side of the, Th that's my of the kind of commuting zone. Great. So it's, um, I think it's come up already, but this distinction between entrepreneurship and inventiveness. You said at the beginning... Patents is a proxy, and I think you make a good defense of patents um, as a proxy for it. But Einstein himself provides a good example of this because he had 50 patents, including for a refrigerator. Um, and no one's got an Einstein refrigerator, mm -hmm. but he couldn't patent the theory of relativity, which had a big effect. And so can you say a bit more, and, and I would invite uh, Resha and Tony to add their thoughts too, on the distinction between being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and having a business idea that you're willing to commit mm -hmm. to and the and idea of being an inventor, because they are clearly distinct Absolutely. terms. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, is some inventors become entrepreneurs, clearly. There are many entrepreneurs who don't have a patent, so these are two distinct things. We are currently working on measuring entrepreneurship in the way that we measure invention here, looking directly in the data at who starts successful businesses that end up growing quite a bit over time. Uh, and while I don't have findings to report from that data yet, uh, broadly my sense is there are likely to be similar patterns in terms of who becomes an inventor, probably not 
identical, but I think similar factors are, are likely to be at play of risk preferences, perhaps taking a more even more central role there, mm. um, uh, differences in exposure and, and opportunities. Um, so, you know, I don't think you should think of the findings here as being unique to inventors. My sense is exposure likely matters much more broadly for any career choice. But this is a particular area that we're able to measure very well at the moment. It's uh, something that matters, if not just for business, you know, more broadly scientific progress is extremely important, we think, in driving society and the economy forward, which is why we focus on it. But it's not that we think the findings are exclusive to innovation and wouldn't apply in other right. contexts. Right. And Reshma, are you trying to create entrepreneurs or inventors in your work or both? I mean, I would say both. I mean, I think we're trying to create change makers. Um, you know, one, I'm sure everyone in here in this room has had an idea that you talked yourself out of, right? <laughs> All of us have. Usually that was a good idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Pull yourself out of it. <laughs> well, but, right. And sometimes it's not. Um, but I think that the idea is, you know, what if we lived in a world where we didn't talk ourselves out of that idea? Where we took those one step, two steps, three steps, and we wouldn't know what would happen. I mean, I, in some ways I feel like I'm a living embodiment of that. I, I'm a serial fa failed politician. I've run twice and lost twice. It's kind of my thing. Um, but I'm also a woman who spends, started an organization called Girls Who Code, and I don't code. I didn't really even bother to learn before I started it. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that happened because I had, I'm, I'm, uh, I like risk. I'm okay with failure. I lost a couple times, I didn't die, and I'm okay. So now when I have an idea, I don't talk myself out of it. And I talk myself into things I know nothing about. So the question is, is how do you inspire that amongst people, right? Um, uh, on, and I think that's really, at Girls Who Code, you know, what, why I think coding is so powerful, because I think most people in this room probably think you have to be a super genius to know how to code. And most of our girls come into our programming thinking that you have to be extra special smart to learn how to code. Mm -hmm. And then they find is that you don't, and that you just have to be willing to fail and to try and to have your code break apart a bunch of times and not give up and to keep trying and to keep trying. And so to me, it's embracing imperfection and being comfortable embracing imperfection that has changed girls' mindsets. And so now, not only will they now you know, try something they didn't think they could do, but they're more likely to follow an invention, yeah. become an entrepreneur, start an organization that they're not an expert in. Thank you. Um, I wanted to push a bit more on the gender side of this, because obviously it's relevant to all of you. And I noticed, Tony, your undergraduate degree was in gender studies. Um, and he's sewing right now. Sorry, uh, I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Again, live. Um, <laughs> um, but it is, a, as Raj says, a very striking finding that, that, that this effect does seem to be kind of very gender specific, that chart you kind of produced. And in some ways that's, uh, in some ways that's quite a challenging finding, perhaps, because we might like to think that we can transcend, the same, to some extent with the race, perhaps, that we can transcend some of those boundaries and that if there's a person who's, you know, the right kind of person in the right field and they're committed to their relationship with you and so on, that it perhaps shouldn't matter as much whether they're the same gender or the same race. I think that would be, but it turns out it's quite a utopian way to think about the world and that that would push us towards more gender-specific programs uh, where we are matching like with like on the basis that they're doing. I, th I think that's quite, I do think as a, matter of policy that's quite challenging and maybe for inst maybe for institutions too yours is specifically girls who code but talk a bit more Arch, about what you think the implications are of that very striking finding because if you're to the extent that it's right i, I shouldn't be worrying too much about whether the, the men inventors are helping women i should be worrying whether there are enough women inventors to help women mm -hmm. and whether the men inventors are helping men and that almost have a very strongly Mm -hmm. sort of segregated way to think about it, to use a deliberately provocative term, whereas the restaurant's making the point that culturally we keep treating men and women differently and girls differently, and we should stop doing that. Well, your research suggests that we should kind of carry on doing that to an extent, doesn't it? Well, I'm not, so I think, uh, you know, you capture the starkness of the findings correctly. Whether the implication is that we absolutely need to have women mentoring women, I think is not clear because it depends upon what men are currently doing when they mentor women or whether they mentor women, right? So it could well be the case that for whatever reason, given current cultural norms and so forth, what ends up getting reinforced when a girl looks for mentor among uh, men, male and mentors in their area, they don't really find the right type of <coughs> connection, et cetera. 
That doesn't necessarily imply that that can never happen, that it's some biological thing that girls can only be uh, influenced by girls. Presumably, there's a way to replicate the kinds of conditions and experiences that female inventors are providing to, to women in their area um, through other mechanisms, be it through men or through changes in media, through changes in social media, changes in what's on television shows and so forth. Yeah, yeah I mean, the way that I, I actually, the way that I interpreted what you were saying too is that it, it's by, it's where your kind of thick or thin connection goes yeah, comes into hard. place, right? Yeah. It's, it's to me, I think that, that seeing, watching a movie about a startup and seeing no women in that if you are a 13 or 14 year old girl that has a major impact in thinking that that field is an option for you and so that so when girls are exposed to female um, inventors even it's simply it's watching a movie or having a cup of coffee or seeing saying you know Sally Sue your neighbor down the stairs just invented that refrigerator a light goes off in her head and she's like oh I can do that too and I actually think it's that it doesn't need to be that intensive an interaction. Mm -hmm. It is simply an idea or conception that is now born in a young girl's mind about what is possible for her life journey. And it has that powerful of an effect. That's why I think it's almost such a shame, right? That we're not making these shifts and changes in our culture and our education institutions so quickly because I think that things can change. I'm not waiting 118 years, Hmm. right? (laughs) And I don't think we have to. Right? I think that there are some real things that you've uncovered, and I think some changes that we can make quite quickly, I think that could get us to parity quite quickly. So there are broader cultural issues as well as those yeah. sort of thick times. Yeah, as well. yeah because at the same that. time, they, we have great empirical data, this national, you know, huge data set, big data, showing historical patterns, and we understand that. But we have to realize mentoring is one-on-one. Like, who's sitting in front of you? It's the micro-interactions that matter just as much. There are some students who... Turn away from certain majors and concentrations because on the first day, that person who was sitting in front of them would say, are you sure you can do this? Mm-hmm. Or maybe you should go into nursing instead of being a doctor. Maybe you should go into the history of science instead of chemistry. Like, study what other people have done because you won't be able to do it. Like, we have to realize that there is a cultural shift that is needed, but at the same time, we have to, we have to understand these, these, these individual moments are gatekeeping moments. And if we think, and if we don't pay attention to how we um, make different industries, different um, occupations open to all, we, it will still like this funneling effect will still continue to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I think about the students who I see on a daily basis, and I'm a, you know I'm a first generation college student, and I tend to like a, a lot of the students who I work with, I have the privilege of working with, are also first in their families to go to college. Um, and so to be a professor, like you know like. The only thing I knew about being a professor was the three stripes on the robe that we get mm-hmm. to wear at Regalia. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But I actually got to see it now I'm here now. But like those, even those little small moments, it may seem funny, it may seem like, did you really choose to go this path? And the answer is kind of, yeah. Um, be based on those little small moments, because you never know that new exposure, that first time that you see something new. And it really changes your, under, your, your way of thinking because you begin to investigate what does that person do? How is that person's life structured? Because it's not just about the money. Because the risk aversion, if that was the case, if I knew I could make $230,000, I probably would have got a different degree than going to sociology, um, to, be, <laughs> um, to, to be honest. But it's like those other things, right? It's like what about that lifestyle? What about that under, like the conferences you get to go to? And like you begin to investigate all these different things, and the whole world opens to you. Mm-hmm. Because it's not what you know, clock you punch day in, day out. Mm-hmm. It's, about the, it's about the lifestyle that you're able to have that people begin to understand because we get a inside knowledge of it. Right. But to all the students who are watching, sociology is a perfectly good <laughs> Yes, <laughs> no. just, yeah. beautiful. Just a public service announcement. Yeah, Not no vapor. Um, can we talk... Uh, uh, <laughs> Can we talk a bit about race and the findings that you had there and the extent to which you think that's similar to gender or being driven by sort of different effects? I think you explained the gender differences quite strongly through some of these exposure effects which we just talked about. But, but the, the findings on race are also very striking, and you see kind of particularly strong um, departure, you said, of white Americans, also kind of Asian Americans as well. It's just that the line, particularly at the top, is very, you know, very, very, very much higher. And uh, if I'm reading it correctly, you can't explain all of that through the parents being much more likely to have been inventors. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't seem like that's what you've found. Yeah. It seems like there's something else going on there too. So can you just uh, 
talk a little bit about what you think is behind some of those race differences, especially for Asian Americans, given that there isn't that sort of straightforward explanation of, well, just their parents are more likely to be inventors. What's behind right. that, do you think? Right. Um, well, so there are, if you think these exposure patterns, we're not able to study this directly in the data, but if you think it operates like gender, where you are more likely to be influenced by people of the same race and ethnicity at present, then if you just, it's like a self-reproduction, right, where if you're a white, white man, yeah. you have more white male mentors. Similarly for Asians, there are a lot of Asians now in science and mm -hmm. technology. Um, for blacks and Hispanics, you see very different patterns. I, I do, though, agree with your intuition, Richard, that those patterns are even sharper than in the other cases. Yeah. And so I think there's something additional going on, in particular with minorities, where it might be a lack of opportunities more broadly, a lack of inclusion, as uh, Tony has stressed in his work. Um, those are actually issues we're investigating directly in some of our ongoing work on racial dis disparities and opportunity more, more broadly. Yeah. But um, I can't say quite what it is from, from these data, mm -hmm. but I agree with your instinct that there's an additional element um, in the context. There's something else going on there race too. Race Don, do you have any more. thoughts on the, the, the race gaps that we saw in this study or how it relates to your own work on relationships and exclusion? Um, absolutely. You know, your, your other research on race and economic opportunity, when you think about the neighborhood itself. Um, and in this country, the difference between growing up in a lower income white neighborhood as compared to a lower income black neighborhood are two different worlds. Um, when you think about the work of Pat Sharkey, um, whose research shows, if I'm not, if I'm, I think I have the numbers right, a white family that, a, a black family that makes $100,000 lives in a similar neighborhood as a, a white family that makes $30,000. And so when you think about the fact that if a two-parent household, each parent bringing home $50,000, lives, can own a home, and think about the parks, think about who their neighbors are, think about the resource that they, they do have exposure to, and the schools, like that whole constellation of, um, of experience that, that person can have, you're making three times what a white family does, what, what a white family makes, and you live in the same kind of neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so understanding the, 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 the racial difference um, or the racialization of class in a, in a, in a very concrete way, um, I think it does affect the kind of exposure that students have to a young, to youth, to a number of things, not just innovation, but um, another thing that, shape them, that shapes their mobility. Mm -hmm. Raj, is there a way we can bring some of this data to bear on some of the more specific questions that we face, like does mentoring work? So Tony mm -hmm. just said, very, we know mentoring works. Well, um, that's a, a strong claim to say that it works, and I think there's evidence in both directions. And the truth is, the reason it's hard to know is because it's really hard to design studies that would tell us, because we don't have the data, we have selection effects, it's very hard to randomize. You, you know, there's, there's, there's so much going on that it's really hard to show whether or not mentoring kind of programs. We have lots of, lots of kind of qualitative evidence, but quantitatively, mm -hmm. it's just incredibly hard to prove the statement that kind of tones made. But you've got... Mm -hmm. all, these, all this data. <laughs> now, is there any way to start connecting that to more direct interventions or policies as you go forward? I'm glad you brought that up, Richard. I mean, I think that's exactly the right next step in this agenda. Um, the way I would phrase the question is, I think a lot of us have the intuition that mentoring works just from introspection, that there's somebody in our lives who had a huge influence that led us down a particular path. And so I view the question not so much as testing the hypothesis of does mentoring or work or not, yes or no, it's more what types of mentoring work, where, what is effective? Is mm -hmm. it light touch mentoring or you know, mentoring of mm -hmm. the girls who code mm -hmm. type in a sense or you know, some, in your school teachers? And so to get at that, you know, one approach you could take is to try to design experiments where you have different mentors and see what happens. That is a very costly way to do things, okay. both in terms of expense, literal financial expense, and in terms of time. Mm -hmm. I think the power of these large data sets that we're assembling and others around the United States are starting to use as well um, is that you can basically take a retrospective look mm -hmm. at the type of efforts that Reshma has been mm -hmm. yeah. pursuing, that many others have been pursuing, and set up research designs that basically allow us to evaluate with fidelity essentially as good as an experiment, what works and what doesn't. So to give you an example, <clears throat> suppose you have a particular effort like a Big Brothers, Big Sisters program that is rolled out or expanded in one city but not another for a certain set of kids of a certain age. What you can do is go back and look at these types of data and zoom in on exactly those kids who are in that neighborhood in a particular age range. Mm 
and compare them to the kids who were a you know, few blocks down, kids who were a little bit younger, kids who were a little bit older, lots of sensible kind of counterfactuals, that is, people who would represent what would have happened had you not had this treatment. And I think you can start to build a library of kind of estimates of understanding which of these programs are working, what are the elements of programs that, that work, and that's the approach. You can, zoom, you can zoom in close enough, even yes. if you don't know the individual. You can use that to zoom in close enough to be able to make some Yes, and you can have the data thing. over time that I think really allows you to understand what's yeah. going on. Right. And, and I think organizations like us should be encouraged to, um, you know, I, I said earlier, you know, Bill, Bill Gates said you, you, you can't solve what you can't measure, right? And so, so all of us should take data seriously. I mean, mm. since inception at Girls Who Code, we have um, tracked all of our girls. So I know, you know, my girls in my 2013 Facebook class, I know where they're in college, I know because of the National College Survey whether they've majored or minored in computer science. And so I know now whether that our intervention um, played a role. And since I can compare them uh, towards whether what the college graduation rates are of the high school that they went to, I can compare right whether our program helps support college readiness. So, you know, we... We take data seriously and we track our girls because I, I don't. I think that, that one of the benefits is, I mean, the, this problem is so bad. So when you when you talk about our work, only ten thousand women graduated in computer science. We have fifty five hundred thousand open jobs. Parity means teaching twenty thousand girls to to computer program and get them into the pipeline. I can count one by one by one by one by one about whether we succeeded or not. And it's the same thing with inventions, right? I mean. Mm-hmm. We need more inventions, so we need more inventors. But you can count about whether your interventions are actually going to increase parity and, mm. and racial equity. So do you, do you have more girls who want to do your camps than you're able to provide yes. help to at the moment? So then how do you select? Do you well, we, randomly we, select them and then follow up the ones that don't go? Well, unfortunately, awesome. we don't select the ones that would have gone uh, majored in computer science anyway. So when they're the, the young girl who's on no, her no. Fourth, fourth coding okay. camp, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's a shame, right? Because we shouldn't have to turn anybody away. Uh, we don't look for GPA. We look for, like, do you want to be a change maker, right? And we intentionally pick girls that are living, half our girls live under the poverty line, and half our girls are, are black and Latina. Uh, we have, Girls Who Code has 3,000 Girls Who Code clubs in the country. We are oversubscribed. I mean, the demand for this stuff, for coding education, is ginormous. And the demand for coding education amongst girls and to be in single-sex environments. I mean, this is what goes to your point. I do think that in this space, right, there is there, our education system, you know, having girls participate in a computer science classroom where it's 80% boys and 20% girls is not working. Like, we need to have spaces where girls can learn, fail, and iterate on their own. Okay. Tony, I used your comment about mentor, mentoring programs as the, the way into that segment, so I should give you the chance to amplify or respond, if you like, to your, to your original statement that we know that they work? I mean, from, from the research I, I've done doing two years of ethnographic observation of a college campus and 100 and, uh, interviews with over 100 students, I've just seen how school administrators are able to go to bat and go above and beyond for students who they know best. Mm. I mean, there's... In a, in, a, in a kind of funny way, there's a prize that is given to the highest GPA in like a certain cluster of the school. And for years, I observed how that the person who won the prize didn't always get the one who had the highest GPA didn't always have didn't didn't always win the prize because that person didn't have an advocate. If that person wasn't known, they necessarily wasn't put up. They wanted someone to expand beyond yeah. just the person who had a four a perfect 4.0 GPA. And I thought it was interesting what they brought to bear in that conversation. Like, oh, this person really helped me with this. They're a great babysitter. They are, gr- they are a great um, um, member of the, of the um, dorm community. They, all of these different things. And so when I think about even those individual moments about who gets the benefit of the doubt for an extension or for um, uh, a test or even when they get in trouble, who gets extent, who gets those extensions? Who get the internships? Who is the fir- who are the first students in line to get help when they apply for summer abroad or um, winter uh, winter uh, uh, winter whatever whether study abroad or internship? Um, the students who are known get the most help. 
Mm. And the sad part about it is I've seen students who've had family members who worked in the White House like as directors and things, and they're the first people who want their resumes edited. Mm. as if they really need to have a perfect resume. Yeah. But the students who would benefit the most mm -hmm. are often left unknown. Mm. And they and colleges assume that they're doing okay, and that's not necessarily the case. They just don't know necessarily how to make their needs, their wants, and their desire known to other people so that there can be a melding. Mm. And, I, and the reason why I say mentoring work is because it's not just what you know, who you know, but who knows you and who is willing to go to bat for you. Yeah. Well, I think you've also used, I think, broken down the idea of mentor into the different components. There's coach, there's navigator, and there's advocate. Yes. Right? And at different moments, you might want different elements. So I think that word is sort of capturing a huge amount of diversity. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to come to the audience. Um, and this is specifically to, Ra to you, Raj, um, about how this work sits within your broader body of work. I sort of see the work of your, you and your colleagues at the... Equality of Opportunity Project, all of their data is online, I remind you, as being really about the inheritance of inequality. Mm -hmm. It's really about, and what are the transmission mechanisms through which inequality is inherited? But very often, if it's an issue such as colleges and so on, it has the feel of something of a zero-sum game, right? There, is, there are only so many seats mm -hmm. at the institutions that are not taking poor kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's something of a sense of, look, in order to get more poor kids to get these opportunities, then to some extent, it will mean fewer of the undeserving rich kids mm -hmm. getting it. I've just put that in to be a bit more provocative. But you've explicitly said that's not the case here. In fact, your, your calculation was if we could bring up <laughs> patenting rates to the same level as at the top, then we'd have quadrupling. And so are you entirely convinced there's no zero sum here at all and that we can just, everyone can patent and there's no problem and there's just a limitless supply of good patent ideas or is there some zero sum here which would require those of us at the top to, to get a little bit less good at hoarding all these patents compared to everybody yeah. else? So you've highlighted precisely what got me interested in focusing on this issue, working on issues of equality of opportunity. Very common question you'd get is, is this, you know, kind of just shuffling? Is this musical chairs? Yeah. If you're helping low-income kids do better, it comes at the expense of others. We think that's useful from perhaps a justice or fairness perspective, but maybe not so important in terms of economic growth. And this struck me as a particular case where at least our intuition is that it's not a complete zero-sum game, that if yeah. there's just this urn of inventions and if you pull one out, then I can't pull that one out. It doesn't feel like mm. that's how it works. In fact, if you think about the empirical literature, it's more that if there's more innovation, there's more capacity for others to build mm -hmm. on your discoveries. So if you find something, I now have a better idea. You discover a new technique, I can now apply that in my work, right? So you could actually argue that it's potentially super additive rather than just, you know, adding up. Now, do I know that if you quadruple the number of inventors, you will get quadruple the amount of innovation in the sense that we care about in society and the economy? Certainly not. And I think it's quite plausible that you'd only get twice the amount of innovation or even one and a half times the amount of innovation. But, wow, that well, would be a tremendous you, increase. Would you live with that? Yes. You'd live with, double, you'd live with doubling the amount of innovation in the U.S., would you? That's right. Fair enough. I think you set the bar way too low. Okay, so we're going to go out to the audience now. Please, if you can, tell us who you are. Please make it a question. I will cut you off if it goes on too long. And the very few people here who did say that they do have a patent, this is not the opportunity to sell your idea for a... <laughs> for a, a robot leaf blower or whatever it is that you're here to talk about. Yeah, I'm going to start with a colleague there because I know he's interested in data, Andre. I'm Andre Perry. I'm here at Brookings. Um, if you look at the South where there's virtually no, um, nobody inventing, um, how do you convince a Bezos or Zuckerberg or one of these other major companies to invest and move their companies there and away from these places that already are inventing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I take a couple, two or three? Would that be okay? Yes. For you, uh, that was right. Brian, let's take a couple more. Let's take uh, the woman here on the second row, uh, and then I'll come to the gentleman here on the first row. So. All right. Greetings, everyone. My name is Keisha Ash. I'm a AAAS fellow at NSF with my colleague here. Uh, we work on broadening participation in computing. I'm also co-founder of a technology-driven mentoring organization, so I'm literally in heaven right now. Um, but I wanted to ask a question around risk and reward because that's what this larger conversation seems to be about. And so we've talked about risk from the sense of economic gain or loss, um, but one of the questions that that 
you know, really garnered my attention was risk in another sense in terms of fam- familial expectations and sort of meeting those, mm. not meeting those, having those at all or not having them and how that might affect sort of all the other downstream um, things that we've been discussing today. So I would love to hear your comments around that. Okay, so I'll take one more from here and then I'll come to the panel and sort of select a way. If you don't, you can f- pass on them if they're too difficult, given someone else on the panel. But I'll take the gentleman here on the front row. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Garrett Mitchell. I write the Mitchell Report. Um, I'm zero on the patent score, and I'm uh, zero on having been elected to public office, too, I might add. Yeah. You're in great uh, company. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Chetty, <laughs> as, as I listened to your presentation and the data, and particularly the maps, I was struck by what seemed to me to be um, uh, a pretty significant uh, overlap with, for example, the the research that Robert Putnam has done in, in bowling alone on social capital and then in, in his later book on our kids and, and the notion of how stuck they get and how difficult it is to get out of there. And it raises the question for me uh, uh, of wh- wh- what factors and, and when did it become like this mm-hmm. in America? And is it as simple as if we could snap your fingers and make the GDP growth rate 4% and fix the inequality problem? Or are there other factors at work? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to hear your thinking okay, on great. that. Great. So um, I will come to you first this time, Raj, and then um, invite the others. To see. So Andre's point about the location of some of these uh, tech, tech companies in particular, uh, Keisha's point about risk and reward and how that plays into familial uh, expectations is fascinating. And Garrett's point about when did it all start to go wrong? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> let me uh, try to take a quick stab at each of those big questions. So on the, you know, what are the factors at play here? Is this just about GDP growth and inequality? When did it go wrong? I certainly share your intuition that there's a lot more going on than just economic factors. So social capital in particular, we find is a very strong correlate of differences in upward mobility across areas, not just rates of innovation, but upward mobility more broadly defined. Uh, Understanding how exactly to manipulate social capital from a policy point of view is very difficult, as you know. And so I think that's why the conversation tends to gravitate towards things like schools and inequality and things that we might be able to tackle through traditional policy tools. But one of the things that I think is great about this conversation that we're having in general is usually when you're talking about these kinds of questions, the policies you're talking about are things like traditional investments in human capital, tax policy, R&D subsidies, corporate policy, and so forth. But here we're having a very different conversation that's really more rooted in sociology and thinking about things like exposure. Mm. Um, And I think it echoes the types of themes that you're talking about. On the issue of the South and how can you potentially change the situation there. So we've been focusing in the Equality of Opportunity Project on certain places in the South, like Atlanta and Charlotte, which strike me as very interesting examples because they are really engines of job growth. There is a ton of Mm. economic activity in those places. Yet, what I think is striking is Atlanta and Charlotte have very few kids who grow up to become inventors, as you see in these data. They also have very few kids from low-income families, more generally, who climb the income ladder and achieve the American dream. And I think those are particularly striking cases because in places where you don't have a lot of opportunity in terms of jobs, you might understand why kids don't have great chances of climbing the income ladder. I think it's particularly surprising and depressing, frankly, in places like Atlanta and Charlotte that you have large swaths of people who are being left out, essentially, of the growth that's occurring because talent is being imported mm-hmm. from other places. Atlanta is basically outsourcing the, the people it brings in for the growth. So you could imagine a company like Amazon or Facebook thinking about developing a presence in those kinds of places it might be more plausible than starting out in the other parts of the South where you don't have the right infrastructure to begin with. Just, you know, just a thought as one thinks about these decisions. And then on the final very interesting question about Risk preferences, um, I mean, my proclivity, as you know, is to give answers based on the data. In this case, I guess an anecdote came to mind as you were um, describing the issue of risk preferences in terms of meeting families' expectations. So in my own case, you know, many of you might know in Indian culture, being a doctor is like kind of the top of the ladder. 
than being an engineer. And I think being an economist is like not even not on the on list. list. Not on the what list. about sociologists? <laughs> no. Yeah, sociologists. Forget about it. Disowned. Disowned. And so I remember when I was an assistant professor at Berkeley, a good friend of my mom's who's a physician uh, asked her, you know, what happened to Raj? Like, I thought he was pretty <laughs> smart in high school. Uh, and so she said, you know, he's a professor at Berkeley. And she said, oh, well, that's good. But don't you think he should do an MD as a backup? <laughs> Just to make sure things go OK. And so, you know, I totally agree that that kind of phenomenon seems uh, potentially quite important. Okay. Tonya Rashma, do you want to add anything on that? Rashma. Another Indian parent mm-hmm. story? Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think similarly, I think that, um, you know, I, I can speak from an immigrant community. You know, I, I remember when I got my first paycheck as a summer intern at Davis Polk and Warhol, my, my father framed it because they had never seen this much money before. And the point of that sacrifice in coming to this country was basically to get a safe job, to take as little risk as possible, which meant being a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. And so I I do think that that plays in very much, I think, to to risk aversion that may happen in in terms of, you know, wanting to start your own company or, you know, or becoming an entrepreneur. Forget about even discussing seed capital. Um, We talked about earlier today, I I mentioned there are less than 30 women in our history that are black women who have raised more than a million dollars in our country. There's something wrong with that. You mean from venture capital specifically or, yeah. And and so, you know, I, I think part of that is not the lack of the interest and, you know, desire or ideation. Um, so, so I do think that, like, really looking at that kind of that, that – and, and to me, that leads into the American dream. You know, when I graduated law school, I was $300,000 in student loan debt. You know, my father encouraged me to take debt after debt after debt after debt because for him, you know, education was the American dream. And you would eventually be able to graduate from a Harvard or Yale to get that six-figure job, right, to pay off that debt. You know, fortunately, I would argue that our debt system, I I see a lot of kids at Girls Who Code who got into MIT, Harvard, or but didn't get the financial aid package, and so went to Caltech or CUNY. And unfortunately, many of these Silicon Valley companies are not even looking for them there. And so, yeah, you can add to that. I would, no, I completely agree with you, Sam. It's like, what do students assess about careers? So when I brought up the issue of becoming a professor, it wasn't just the economics that was, that, that became an interest to me. And I had to do a lot of explaining about going to graduate school in of itself. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, there are only three, it's about an information gap, right? Because they're only in, in my neighborhood, there are three. Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And the reason why Princeton is on there is because of the fresh Princeton they left. <laughs> right? There is simply an information gap about what it is at even the undergrad level, let alone at gra- for graduate school. To say I'm going to graduate school for quantum, you know, and I'm going to study quantum mechanics, I did get the question. Like, I thought, oh, I thought Tony was smart. He's going to a school called Amherst. What is that? Like, literally, <laughs> that was Amherst College. And then, my neighbor, people didn't understand exactly what it was. And so the assessment of the reward is not just about how much money you're going to make. Because something that interests me about when I actually learned about what like, Professor Budmiller did during the summer is I was like, oh, wait, when, you, we're not, when we're out of school, you're out of school. So you get a spring break, you get a Thanksgiving break, a six-week winter break, and summer's off, technically, because we have to write books and stuff. Um, and I was just like, oh, I like that. I like being able to set my own hours. And so when I had my first job, and it was more of a nine-to-five, I learned more about what I didn't like. But I was exposed to that prof- uh, my professors and other people, and I began to narrow down the industry that I want to go into. And so that is another way in which exposure, exposure actually matters, but you can only have it when you leave the confines of X community, which is actually very, very hard when you think about who gets to climb and who doesn't. Mm. Who gets to be exposed and do the internships? Like, do you want to be an anesthesiologist or do you want to be a surgeon? Those are two very different lives. Um, I'm sorry, or a general practitioner. Those are two very different lives, two different types of medical school training, different years, all that kind of stuff like that. And that is when, again, Exposure matters, and the assessment of risk is different than just economic mm. capital. Information. Thank you. Right, let's keep going. Um, hands, questions. Uh, where's the microphone? Yeah. Let's just go down here. Come to the, the gentleman right on the uh, on the aisle there, and then the gentleman just to, in front of him to the right, and then we'll go over there to the lady on the left. Yes. Uh, the, our schools and our school districts are on the front lines. Sorry, could you say who you are if you don't mind? Lisa. Uh, Bill Gormley from Georgetown University. Thank you, Bill. So our our schools and our school districts are on the front lines. They have a lot of important decisions to make. If you were to offer advice to them, would you focus on uh, whom they should hire, uh, the, the demographics of the teaching, 
Would you focus on classroom pedagogy, maybe focusing more on one-on-one -on -one instruction? Uh, would you focus on extracurriculars, on robotics on, by the way. science fairs, or something else? You talk um, about K-12 schools specifically. K-12. K-12. That's right. Okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you, Bill. What would the, you focus? On? The gentleman in front of you, just to your right, just to pass it forward. I can ask that one right. Uh, hi, I'm Ryan Bandar. I'm an economic policy advisor. I actually had a very similar question in terms of the fact that, you know, one of the things that you're... Could you speak up a little bit? I think the mic's not working very well. Working now? Yeah. Okay. One of the things that you mentioned in, the th in your uh, presentation was identifying the kids who have the potential. So obviously it's tough to, you know, legislate how families and, you know, things outside of that, like, identify those kids, but how the schools can identify the kids other and well, so what more could they do i mean obviously it's wonderful to have nonprofits like girls who code but is there something from like a, is there a policy lever that you can pull where mm -hmm. they can do a better job identifying mm -hmm. and then yeah you know, helping these children within the school system so related to the earlier question yeah and then uh, over here on the far my far right thank you thank you i'm marcela escobar i'm a visiting uh, fellow here and um well, thank you for this timely work. My, my question is whether you'd looked at firms. Like, you've looked at elementary school test scores. You've looked at colleges and their impact on invention. Have you looked at the impact of firms in individuals' ability to innovate? Or by then, are the cards, you know, the deck stacked? Companies, great. Okay, so those good questions. So the first two could almost be taken together, I think, mm -hmm. uh, around identifying high potential in school, but also what would you do in K-12? And I don't know if Ted mentioned it or not, but some of Raj's earlier work was on teacher quality uh, and the impact that that had. So I hope you'll be able to speak to that. And then Raj's question about you know, firms and the impact of firms mm -hmm. in those neighborhoods. Raj, why don't you have a go first again? Yeah, so let me say a few things about what I think we could do. So first, in general, I think there's an issue in the United States of uh, how we recruit and retain the best teachers. Um, there's quite a bit of rigidity in the system in terms of being able to keep the best teachers in the school system. As Richard mentioned in our earlier work, we look at how the value added of teachers seems to affect kids' long-term outcomes quite substantially. That was focused on things like earnings and college attendance. I suspect it would apply to outcomes like innovation as well. So I think having being able to attract very good teachers in our schools can be important both in terms of pedagogy and in terms of mentorship, right? And I think the US is in a different position relative to Scandinavian countries, for example, where if you think about a country like Finland, kids who are at the top of their class aspire to become teachers. And I think in the United States, for various reasons, partly cultural, partly related to status, partly related to pay, that's not the case. And so that's a broader issue in education that I think would have bearing on innovation. Yeah. There's a second issue of <clears throat> the particular teachers you have. So uh, do they connect with the students? As Tony said, you know, do they recognize the challenges that kids from particular backgrounds face? Does that mean we should be training our teachers differently or recruiting a different set of teachers? I think that's a really interesting set of issues to think about that could be quite important. And then the third point about you know, identifying these kids that, uh, you know, how can we identify these kids? Can we do that in some systematic way in schools through policy? What I'd say there is I was surprised, frankly, by the predictive power of even simple math standardized test scores in third grade. So, you know, the current discussion of standardized tests, as you all know, they're much maligned as measures of ability that, you know, this is capturing teaching to the test or various other things. But these measures do have some predictive power. I'm not advocating for the standardized testing system as it is, but what I think that suggests is there's value in investing and in trying to better measure kids' talents. There's one particular talent which might be you know, associated with innovation, they're gonna be kids with other talents where they'd excel in other paths. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can figure that out relatively early, we can help guide kids down each of those paths. So I think investing more in understanding what types of metrics at early ages beyond just these standardized tests. Is it about measuring non-cognitive skills or even maybe measuring risk mm -hmm. uh, tolerance or um, persistence, things like that, grit? Um, I think that type of measurement and trying to incorporate that more systematically could be uh, very valuable. Can I ask you to pause there? Obviously, there was a question yes. about firms. So I'd actually quite like Tony and Rashman to come in on this point about schools. Tony, your work at the privileged poor looks at the ones from private schools and how well they do, even if they're from low-income backgrounds. I think you attribute a lot of that to network, social capital, cultural capital. Uh, could it also be about the quality of the teaching in those schools that actually just, you know, teacher for teacher, one of the reasons people 
go to private schools to try and get the kids in them is because they're, they are higher quality institutions of one form or another. Do you find that? Well, I don't know. I mean, on that piece, because I was a head start, I, I had a taste of both. I was head start through 11th grade public, and then in 12th grade, I went to Gulliver Prep in Miami um, for my senior year. I think it's not necessarily teacher quality. I think it's opportunity for teachers to actually showcase their talents. Because if you're trying to teach a class where the average class size is, class size is 40, as compared to your class load is 4 to 10, um, even the best teacher will get burnt out over time when you're overcrowded and you're trying to manage resources and you don't have enough spaces in your, in your, in your, in your classroom for every student to have a chair. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, if you go to private school, most of your teachers, 75, some, some schools as high as 90, have terminal degrees. And most will have a master's of a, a specialized subject. So I'm not trying to say, even on a credentialing level, private school teachers may actually be more credentialed on, a, on the way that we would think. And so I don't want to say that is equivalent to teacher quality, though, because the opportunity that private school teachers have to teach not only a select group of students, yeah. but also when you're talking about the Harkness table and it's six people reading right. primary text, that's a very different experience. Yeah. And, and, and it is true. When you think about the difference between lower income students who go to public high school, those who I call it w, w disadvantage, and the privileged poor, those who go to private schools, it's their exposure to their peers and to a certain type of teaching style is what gives them a social advantage in college of navigating, they don't experience culture shock in the same way, of navigating teacher relationships. And so it's not saying that they will automatically do better GPA-wise, mm -hmm. but they know to look for what really makes college the most, the biggest bang for your buck, and that's getting, that's, that's milking it for every mm -hmm. um, opportunity, whether it's research, social, economic, or extracurricular, that, it, that they have available to them. So I think you make a very important dis distinction around teaching style, but also between good teaching and good teachers. Now, mm -hmm. clearly those two things are related, as Raj's earlier work shows. But I think you point to the fact that good teaching takes place in a better resourced environment with other kinds of supports in a certain kind of climate and so on. And so there are other factors that go into good teaching mm -hmm. as well as the work we know about a good teacher. It's sort of quite an individualist way to think about it. Reshma, if, if the schools are doing better, you wouldn't need girls because uh, right, they'd be exactly. coding in school, surely. Well, I think one of the so. things that's not happening or we're encouraging to happen more in schools is data collection. So there is a massive movement across the country to get computer science in every single school. Mm -hmm. And what Girls Who Code has really pushed for is great, but can you track gender and race? Can you make sure that every time you put computer science in a classroom, you're collecting data on how you're doing in recruiting kids, women and kids of color, right? Mm -hmm. And by doing that and by having that data, we can see what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. To me, you know, a lot of solving this problem, if you assume and then you accept that there's a gender gap in most computer science classes and we are far not reaching kids under the poverty line or, or, or kids of color, is to think about like what we can do to change curriculum to make it more attractive. So a simple intervention that we have been kicking around is this idea of you know, changing the standards to mandate having women in tech spotlights in computer science classes. Mm. So if you're going to teach a computer science class, you're going to talk about Ada Lovelace. You're going to talk about Katherine Johnson. You know, you're going to make it very clear to boys and girls right, that the pioneers of computer science were women. Mm. And so that chart that Raj you know, popped up there where you see that dramatic increase you know, of girls being interested when exposed to role models who are inventors, we can have a hope you know, that that one small intervention can actually make a difference. I think it really can. Mm, good, thank you. Let's come back to Marsha's qu question about firms and the role of kind of firms. And I think particularly in particular places, were you thinking that, that the way they're embedded in communities and networks, or was it within their internal labor markets? Could you just say a tiny bit more? So within, okay. Yeah, because your measure is in their 30s, yeah. so they've been in work for a while. Yeah. So, you know, we think firms, you know, are likely to matter, but I come at it more from a different angle. So if you look, for instance, at women in certain scientific fields like biology, for example, you, have, you nearly have gender parity in terms of the number of graduate students who start out in biology, but then you see a dramatic change over time in terms of the number of women who stay in the field to eventually run their own lab or lead a scientific team. And so clearly there's something happening there, right, where through childhood we're getting people to the entry point in the career stage, but then things are happening within firms or within universities and so forth. And so I absolutely think it's important to think about those issues. That said, in this context, you know, the way we're looking at the data, 
it does seem like these childhood factors drive a lot of what's going on, who gets in the door at Google to begin with, as opposed to mm. what happens thereafter. So I think we should be paying attention to both sets of issues, and there might be different types of factors that are at play in terms of family leave policies or discrimination or other things that arise uh, within firms relative to the mentorship, childhood exposure effects that we've been talking about here. Right, thank you. OK, let's do another round. Do we have time for one more round? <clears throat> So yes, the gentleman right in front of you, and then the woman two rows in, uh, in front of him, and then this gentleman here. Yes. I'm Carl Polzer, and I started a project called uh, Center on Capital and Social Equity, which uh, explores inequality and also seeks uh, more inclusion, particularly in the middle and the bottom. And my question's about the risk aversion. If you look at maybe looking at just those that, that have gotten patents, it's too small of a universe. It's like just looking at the people that got to the NBA. <clears throat> you need to look at the the risk reward of putting all that time and money into the education versus the reward, all the bench scientists and all the the, mm -hmm. the professions that are drawn from and the people that make you know regular salaries, mm -hmm. where most of the workers are. And then from my own family experience, my grandfather had a patent that really revolutionized rayon production, but the company got all the money. He was had a tiny little house and a bunch of tools in the basement. My brother has a bunch of patents, X-ray equipment for ore underground, dra dragged around by helicopters. The company gets all the money. So you need to look at the arrangements, mm -hmm. you know, and how the person benefits from the, mm -hmm. from the path. Well, they, I mean, it's Raj, complicated, I know, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a bigger universe. Do they actually get the economic value from it? I mean, Raj's chart did suggest that at least some people mm -hmm. are getting quite a bit of value. So it might be the patent lawyer that your family's using. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Yes. Hi, so my name is Monica Smith, and I'm with the Smithsonian's Lummelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. And we do a lot of programming with children and families, particularly ages 6 to 12, which we know is sort of that sweet spot for capturing young inventors in the making. Um, but one thing I found interesting, in, in a lot of programs, we bring in inventors. So the idea is to show diverse inventors, get people to actually get to meet them and see mm -hmm. them and see these role models. Mm -hmm. But what I'm struck by is when we're looking for diverse inventors, how often we find them in government, mm -hmm. more so than in private um, corporations. Mm -hmm. Um, so many come from NASA, for example, or NSF or NIH or, you know, other labs in government. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them um, are later in their career, and they talk about that that was where they could get work. Mm. You know, that was the place that actually was hiring African Americans mm. and so on. So you could talk a little bit about hiring and some of those issues about discrimination that there should be a lot of good data from government about who's patenting, who's, you know, on these teams mm. And, and how does that compare to what's happening in the pu you know, private Public sector? Public and private sector doesn't get good. And there's a gentleman in front of you, actually, a couple of rows in front. I think you had your hand up, head under the glasses on. Yeah. And then we'll come back to the panel. Um, I'm, test, test. I'm Patrick Lapid, uh, economist, CFPB. Um, what was your name and again I think, at the beginning? Oh, what was that? What was your name at the beginning? Oh, Patrick Lapid. Patrick. I'm an economist at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Hmm. I'm interested in education still, so... Hence, I'm here today. Um, thank you for the presentation. My question, I think it might be a lot more of sociology, actually, or social psychology and interactions, but um, based on what's going on in the economics profession about women in economics as well as um, women in um, technical fields, I think that, and it's more of a general comment, that although I feel like in the short run, same sex or same people of color um, pairings might be beneficial in mentoring, at some point, um, us men have to step up, like fathers have to step up with teaching their sons that um, that women can be role models for them and teaching um, us ourselves that um, um, that we can mentor female economists, that female um, scientists and so on. And how much can we do with cross gender and cross race mentoring as an economist? I came up through the AEA summer training program and its pipeline program for minority economists and um, I might be Asian American, but I'm Filipino American. So finding another Filipino American economist ain't that easy. <laughs> so, you know, all the women and all the people of color in the econ economics profession, I owe their gratitude to. So, right. Okay. Thank you for that. I just repeat again: nothing wrong with sociology. Absolutely not. Some of our best friends are sociologists. <laughs> My degree is in philosophy, so I'm not going to throw any stones at sociology. I have an undergrad in sociology, okay. uh, econ. <laughs> Who else has studied sociology? Hands up. <laughs> 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 good choices, all good choices. Exactly.
I'm actually going to start with the restaurant because I think at least at least two and three, uh, the kind of hiring uh, point, yeah. pu public-private yeah. distinction is yeah, important. And then this, I think, this point about that we don't want to accept gender norms as they are, which I think is your point too. Right. And how? Do, what's the role of men in changing yeah. those gender assumptions? So I'll start with the listen. You know, forty percent of girls who coach teachers, and we hire th thousands of teachers a year, are men. Like this movement is built. Uh, often on the backs of fathers and men who have had enough and who want to see a different reality for their daughters. Um, and so I don't think that it is, uh, I don't think it, it's, it's yes and or both and, right? It's making sure that we're showing our girls that there are incredible women who they can follow in their footsteps and exposing them to incredible men who want to use their, their resources, their power, their, their time uh, to elevate and to support a girl. Um, and so I think we need to encourage more of that. One of the best things that happened to me this year is I went to the Rochester Institute of Technology to meet with the Women in Computing Group, and there were three guys there. And I said, who are you? And they said, we're the men in, who are supporting the Women in Computing Group. Hmm. And they saw it as their obligation in classrooms to make sure that women were called on. To your point, hmm. you had an amazing study that came out a day, yet, uh, two days ago that 76% of women in computing report discrimination in their computing jobs compared to 16% of men. Uh, I was uh, t uh, talking to, uh, I was speaking at an event and uh, interview or speaking with a bunch of men who were working in a financial services firm who uh, in this firm hires you know tens thousands of engineers and he said you know Rashma the, the first question I ask in an interview is often a question about baseball do you think I should do that <laughs> probably not there is something happening in the hiring process right in the offer process in the first three years where 40% of women will leave within the first three years, that is broken. And I think we need to spend more time. We've evaluated the lack of you know, uh, disparity or parity in gender and race in, you know, in tech, but we're not tracking it and looking at what's happening and why. And I think we can do a better job and we can put, we can put the onus on tech companies to provide that, that data with us. But I do think that a lot of people are finding a home in government mm -hmm. um, to, to succeed and to innovate. Do you see that difference then, to Monica's point, between public and private sectors in terms of their awareness and intentionality of the need to be more Well, diverse. I mean, if you think about what's happening in the Valley, I mean, a lot of, some of these companies are young companies that don't even have HR departments. You, know, you mm -hmm. can't get away in government, you know, basically sending five emails to an HR person about sexual harassment and then getting no response and the guy getting promoted, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not, I will, I will say nothing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we hope, right, that, that government is more mature and better at weeding out this type of behavior and having a zero tolerance policy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that tech companies have a way to go uh, um, on this. Thank you. T Tony, I'm going to come to you next uh, on any of that, but specifically this point about the role of men in changing assumptions about gender in these particular sectors or in particular areas because of your own interest in that. Is, this, is, it, up, is it up to men to change gender roles as, at least as much as it is women? Say yes. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I set it up as a yes question. No, no, no. I mean, if you say no, we're gonna have a much more interesting discussion. Uh, no, I mean the answer is the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, you um, when you think, especially when you think about the people who are positions of power, when you think about who are who are more likely to be a department chair, a dean, a provost, uh, when you think about um, not only who gets who gets an offer, but um, the, the the disparity and starting salaries and everything that gives you from startup funds when you're doing trying to set up your lab to all these things is absolutely you have to shoot for equity um, to the point that I think universities actually need to start re looking at um, um, assessing their assessing the discrimination in a number of different ways especially even looking at starting contracts mm -hmm. of uh, faculty members so that you can start going to parity with research funds with well when I think about Women who are starting labs and men who are starting labs. You know, lab, labs are very, very expensive. You know, a difference between a, a you know a hundred thousand dollars or even two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that goes a very long way when the op, when paying a postdoc or five postdocs in your office is a huge expense. Yeah. But if you have three postdocs as compared to five, those extra two those extra two minds can help you get into science, can help you get into nature, can help you get your patents in, can help you get you know, your research out to get promoted. So I'm thinking about even within the fact, within the fact, within the, within academia, but it translates very well to like, who are your mentors? Mm -hmm. because, if you can, because of who is in positions of power historically, you have to have 
a coalition, yeah. um, and one in which that you open the doors to more people. Thank you both for that. I think, you too, I think you've done a very good job on two and three, so I think, Raj, feel free to comment on that, but I don't want to lose Carl's point, the sort of family tragedy of a family of inventors who failed to capitalize on it. And looking at your charts, in a way, we should be pleased if people don't make a lot of money from their inventions, because if they're disproportionately from the top of the income distribution, then if they also get wealthy, then it will make it worse. It will make inequality worse rather than better. If we see it as a way to improve inequality, because it's poorer kids who are doing it, then we do want them to get the money. So, A, are, they, are people getting the money from their patents? And B, do we want them to, given who's getting the patents? <laughs> so... I'm happy to take that, and then I'd like to make a point on the discrimination issues, which I also think are very important. So in the data, as you saw, the experience that you described, so the patents that are assigned to the company but are invented by a particular person in the company are included. Those people would be counted as inventors in our data. Um, and what you could see is that, at least on average, may not be true in every case, people who had very high-impact patents actually make quite high salaries. Now, uh, why is that important? I think, you know, given that this is such a risky career, knowing that at least there's some scenario where you do quite well is potentially quite important. Um, I think it also bears on the issue of whether financial incentives, as I was saying, is that really what we should be focusing on versus where the conversation has, has focused today on, on the issues of inequality. I mean, you're, of course, right, Richard, that if the set of people who have this opportunity are from the top to begin with and that gives them an opportunity to get even richer. Yeah. You're going to amplify inequality. I'm not sure. I mean, while that is a valid concern, I think if in the process of amplifying inequality, you're also increasing economic growth, thereby li lifting the absolute standard yeah. of the poor and middle class, I'm not sure that we should say yeah. that is a bad thing. That's a kind of good inequality if it helps. It's a yeah, if it happens inequality. that way, I, I think that might be okay. Um, I want to come back to the issues of discrimination, which are, of course, extremely important, and both men and women, I think, can play an important role. I think there are subtleties here, though, that are important to keep in mind. So one piece of evidence uh, on issues of discrimination that both highlights its importance but highlights the nuance are studies that people have done using an audit approach. So this is basically you send a set of CVs, a set of, resume, a set of resumes, to people who are running labs or hiring at a company, and you vary only one thing, the name of the person. So it might be Emily instead of Mike, thereby just changing the gender on the uh, on the CV, right, uh, holding the rest of the record fixed. And it's a well-established fact that if you have a woman's name on the CV instead of a man's name on the CV, you get a lower callback rate. But what I think is a subtlety there is that that's true both if the head of the lab is a man and if the head of the lab is a woman. So this is not exclusively driven by a pure, you know, gender bias issue. It's something maybe about broader perceptions, norms, something deeper that we need to figure out. And so I think engaging with those aspects of the data is extremely important as we think about tackling these issues. Thank you, Raj. We're, we're approaching the end of our session, so I'm afraid I won't take any more questions, but I will ask a closing question of Raj, if you'll permit me, which is to say that having uh, seen you present now and read many of your papers, the story is that inequality is very strongly inherited uh, and that the transmission mechanisms through education, through housing, place, social capital, invention, and so on, are, are really pretty strong. Those transmission mechanisms from one generation to the next are, are strong, in some cases perhaps even strengthening. And so overall, the picture is rigorous, clear, and rather depressing. And so my question to you is, given all of that, do you have reasons to feel hopeful yeah. about the potential for reducing the power of those transmission yeah. mechanisms, for making inequality somewhat <coughs> less inherited in the US? And if you do have such hopes, what are they and why? So I actually am some, I have somewhat of an optimistic take on the data, not because of the national trends which you described, which I agree are not very encouraging, but because you do see pockets of the United States, places, colleges, schools, where there are extremely good outcomes for kids in low-income fa families, mm. where black kids do well. And I think what that shows, it's, it's kind of an existence proof to me that this is a problem we can solve. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is simply, how do we go about solving it? And so I think that poses a challenge for us as researchers to figure out exactly what those solutions are. And it's an opportunity for everyone here in the audience to figure out how to enact uh, some of those solutions. And so, you know, I think my optimism comes from the fact that uh, you know, the fact that there are these places and there's some systematic properties those places have. You know, it's not that 
It's just random variation in the data. There are certain types of features like more integrated communities, stronger schools, more mm -hmm. social capital, uh, and so on, greater exposure that I think could be translated to policy that suggests this is actually something fixable. And it's fixable, I think, at a local community level, which I think is extremely important. When you look at the kind of monolithic national trend that I ended with, you might think, wow, that's such a daunting problem. Like, how are we ever going to make a dent there? But when you see the variation across areas, you start to feel like, yeah, I can do something about this in my own community, in my own college, by changing admissions policies, mentoring policies. And I think that can be very empowering. So a deep problem, but a tractable one is the solution. Well, uh, we're out of time, but please join me in thanking uh, Resh McCartney and Ra. <laughs>